Romans chapter 8. There's so many wonderful thoughts in this great chapter. Uh, I mean, it begins with a great verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I'm glad once we're saved, our sin is gone, and the Lord don't condemn us. Uh, we are set free, and there's so many wonderful truths in this great chapter. But I want to look, uh, begin in verse 35. The Bible says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to open the Word of God, the perfect law of liberty, and find uh, your will for our lives. And Lord, we're thankful for the promises contained therein. We're thankful for the direction. We're thankful, Lord, for the instruction in righteousness. And Lord, we're certainly thankful, Lord, that we can come today and celebrate you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Now, Father, we do pray for those that are sick. We pray for those that long to be here but cannot be here. We pray that, Lord, you would touch them and help them, bring them back to us soon and safely. And then, Father, we do pray for those that are providentially hindered, that, God, you would move in their lives and help them. But, Lord, for these that have come this morning, I pray that, Lord, you would bless them, and, Lord, you would uh, enlighten their minds and instruct them in the will of God. I pray for those that are watching live stream, that, Lord, long to be here but can't. Lord, you'd bless them the same. Now, Father, I pray for those that are very sick. I pray that, Lord, you would really reach down and touch them. I pray for those families that have had loved ones pass away. God, you would touch them and help them. Now, Father, sit down amongst us today. Have your will and way, and we'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, I want to look at several things here from this wonderful text. Uh, here the great apostle, inspired to pin down these words, asked the question, what or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, you know, if they could, they would. There are a lot of people who think the church is non-essential. There are a lot of people that think that what you and I believe is nonsense. And they look at us as a nuisance in their life. And if they could do away with us, they would. But it also begins to name a lot of things that you may experience. Uh, and it says, can these things separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, shall tribulation? Well, we all face tribulation. The Bible says, they that uh, live godly shall suffer persecution. Uh, shall famine, nakedness, peril, sword... It goes on in verse 37, Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, powers, things present, things that come, height, depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God. In other words, there's nothing you'll face or no one you'll face that can separate you from God's love. He told us there in Jeremiah 33 that he has loved us with an, or 31, that he has loved us with an everlasting love. Uh, you, you can't be separated from God's love. Now, that can't be said about human. There are some people that might love you today and not love you tomorrow. But Jesus is going to love you, and he's going to love you in spite of you. And that's a blessing. This chapter lets us know that he is for us. In verse number uh, 26, we find the Holy Spirit is for us. Look what it says. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth with our infirmities. Verse 31, we find the Father is for us. Who shall 
what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And then in verse 34, we find the Son of God is for us. For uh, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We find that God's for us. And I bless his holy name. I'm, I'm interested in something, but I'm wanting to look at what he says here in verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Uh, I got to thinking about that a minute ago. We're more than conquerors. Some days it doesn't feel like we're conquering anything. Some days it kind of seems like everything goes wrong. You ever have one of them days? We had that day Friday. Miss Nett went and got her hair done. She'd come home and somebody hit the mirror on her car. I mean, just shattered the whole side of her mirror. She says, you need to order one of them so we can, I can't drive around with the mirror messed up. I said, I am not fixing that mirror. I said, I'm not taking the door apart on this car and putting a mirror on it. I did that on a Sentra that Sydney had, and, you know, it had no electronics, and it was a Sentra. It wasn't, you know, missing its affinity. I said, no, call insurance. That's why we have insurance. Let them put the stinking mirror up. That's how the day started. Well, it seemed like every time you get on the road, somebody was running stop signs, somebody trying to hit you. I mean, it's crazy. Well, at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock Friday night, I get a phone call. It's from the Home Depot where Dr. Phil used to work a little bit. Uh, back early November, Miss Nett and I went and we ordered some carpet, replacing some carpet in the house, and she's going to retile the kitchen, all that stuff. Well, they, they told us they, they could put it in on December 22nd, six weeks out. They called Friday night at 5 o'clock. Said, uh, yeah, all your stuff's in. We can do it tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Now, that don't mean anything to you. But they tell me they're coming at 8 o'clock in the morning, which means i got to clear out Jordan's room, my office, our bedroom, and rip up all the kitchen flooring, which is also the laundry room, which means i got to take the refrigerator out, the washer, the dryer, the utility sink. And guess what? We did it. But it wasn't a good day. I didn't feel like a conqueror. That refrigerator conquered the heck out of me. All right, so what does that mean that we're more than conquerors? Well, it simply means that we're more than conquerors once the Holy Spirit has conquered us. Once He has conquered us and indwelled us, and He conquers us through convicting us of sin and drawing us to Christ, and once He draws us to Christ and we believe on the Lord and the Holy Spirit seals us into the day of repentance, uh, uh, redemption that means nothing external or internal will destroy our eternal security we're more than conquerors there are people who die but they live eternally there are people who get sick there are people who face things it does not separate us from the love of Christ and it does not defeat us eternally but what I'm interested in this morning, in verse number 38, he says, For I am persuaded. And I just want to give you a few things that you need to be persuaded about. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That word persuasion is a very important word. You see... Uh, you can tell somebody about the gospel. They might not believe it. You have to persuade them. How do you persuade them? Well, first of all, they need to see Jesus in you. Second of all, they need to see that you have a zeal for God that they don't see anywhere else. And third of all, they need to see how God's changed your life. And so you persuade them through the scriptures and through your personal testimony, and you persuade them in how God has moved in your life. But there's some things we need to be persuaded about. If, if we're not persuaded, we can't persuade anybody else. So first of all, you need to be persuaded about your salvation. 
You need to know that you 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 know that you've been saved. You need to know that. There's a lot of folks that hope they are. There's a lot of folks that wonder if they are. There's a lot of folks that long to be. You need to have it nailed down. You need to know that you're saved. You need to be persuaded to that because I promise you, you know, there's an enemy out there called the devil. And he doesn't like giving up folks. And when folks do get saved, he doesn't want them to persuade anybody else. So he'll do everything he can to have your life in a whirlwind. You need to get that nailed down that you're saved. One of the biggest tools of the devil is something called guilt. We read your verse number one where there is no condemnation. Uh, can I say when you're saved, the guilt is gone. But when the devil starts making you feel guilty and he starts tempting you to question your salvation, then you can't persuade anybody else if you're not persuaded yourself. You're in and out and up and down and all around. Well, how in the world can you be a witness when you don't know yourself? So you need to be persuaded. How, how, do, how do you know, preacher? Well, we're saved through the Word of God. We're saved by faith. We're saved because of the grace of God. But you need to be persuaded by this book and get in this book and make certain that you have done what this book has said. And if you're questioning about that, you need to come. We'll take the Bible and show you what the Bible says. We'll take you to 1 John chapter 5. We'll take you to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll take you to Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 10. We'll show you what the Word of God says, and then you have to be, be convinced in your mind through the Word of God you've done that in your heart. And if you're persuaded, then, then you're more than a conqueror. Nothing will deter you once you're persuaded that you have been born again. We need to be persuaded that we have security. There's a lot of people that are taught you can lose your salvation. Well, the Bible says that I'm in his hands in John chapter 10, and his hands in the Father's hands, and no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Everywhere where it talks about eternity, it talks about everlasting life. Matter of fact, you, can't, you can twist Scripture, but you can't show me where the Bible says, well, now, if you do this, you're going to lose it. You see, those that believe you can lose it, their problem is, is they think they had to do something to earn it. See, my salvation isn't based on anything with me. My salvation is based on the finished works of Calvary. The gospel is that Jesus uh, died according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. It's all a work of Christ. He's the one that saved me. I'm in Him, my dear friends. My security's in Him. He's my high priest, and He's never going to die again. And under the commandments of the law and the... Uh, cities of refuge as long as the high priest was alive you had refuge and he's our high priest is never going to die again so i have a refuge in him my security is in christ not me because i'm here to tell you we're up and down and the wind blows and we're we there's those days we don't feel too saved but i'm glad i'm saved because I'm in Christ. And you need to be persuaded of your security. If Miss Janet was here, she'd tell you she was a Methodist for 40 years. One of the greatest things that ever happened to her outside of salvation is when somebody showed her the Scripture and she realized she couldn't lose her salvation. You see, those that uh, teach works, they have to keep their congregation, so they threaten them by saying, if you aren't faithful, you'll lose it. Hmm? You know, we go out and knock on doors and hang literature on doors and stuff like that. We was out this about 10 years ago. And a uh, little uh, Lutheran church up the street had been out. And I saw some of their literature. And since they gave it away, I thought, well, I might as well take it because I didn't want whoever lived there to read it. Well, I brought it back and I read it. And they try to word things pretty much the way we word things. But they just twist it just a little bit. And... Uh, they basically said if you didn't come every Sunday and take their communion, you'd lose it. 
you wouldn't have faith. But I'm glad, hallelujah, I'm saved and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. You need to be persuaded of that. Hmm? A lot of people are led astray because they're not persuaded. Hmm? You need to be persuaded of the Scriptures. I have no, no doubt that I hold the Bible that God wrote. There are a lot of so-called versions. I refer to them as perversions because man wrote them. Uh, listen, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, I, if you believe God formed the worlds by saying let there and then it happened, if you believe God tells the sun when to shine, if you believe God makes the grass grow, if you believe that uh, God forms the baby in the womb, if you believe that God uh, uh, feeds all the grasshoppers and all the animal kingdom, and if you believe God sits on his throne, and if you believe God is God, then how can you not believe that God can preserve his word for his people? Hmm. The Bible says we're begotten again by an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. And it's very important to see that God used holy men of old to pin down the Scriptures. Now, I'm not going to get into it today. I have in times gone by. Um, but the Bible's come through seven major translations, language translations. And in Psalms chapter 12, you'll find that uh, the Bible says the Word of God is pure, purified seven times. The seventh major language translation was your King James Bible. Every false Bible out there gets their Greek text from the Vaticanus. The Vaticanus was the Catholic text. And they removed a lot of things they didn't like. And starting in 1860, there were two wicked men by the name of Wilcott and Hort who started taking the Vaticanus text and trying to come up with an English translation that would fit their lifestyle more than what the Word of God says. The King James Bible is the only Bible that came from the Texas Receptus. That's the Greek text. That's the common language. That's the language the apostles penned it down in. And my dear friends, it's, it's, it's pure. Uh, I don't believe this contains the Word of God. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe every period, every comma, I believe everything about it. It's the Word of God. We're going to be judged by the Word of God. How can we, God judge us by the Word of God if He don't give us the Word of God? And so I'm glad we've got, it, we've got the Bible. And I don't have to fret over that. I'm persuaded this is the Bible. I've done a lot of study. I know this is the Bible. And it's been proven in my life. If nothing else, I've seen how many lives it's changed. That's the evidence I need. Hmm? Is the Bible being preached tonight? I got saved. I've seen it change a lot of people's lives. Hmm? And I bless the Lord for it. You need to be persuaded about the Scriptures. I believe if God promised something, there's over 30,000 promises in this book. I believe if He promised it, you can bank on it. You just need to be persuaded by the Scriptures. Um, they're a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. When heaven and earth has passed away, you can still stand on the Scriptures. It's forever settled in heaven. And I thank the Lord for that. You need to be persuaded about the sanctuary. There are people who say, well, I can meet with God on the lake. Well, you can, you, I guess you can ease your conscience that way, but God appointed the house of God for us to come and assemble ourselves to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. I'm thankful for the sanctuary. Now, I know we've got a lot of folks sick, to, sick today, but I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad we can come and we can pay homage to our Savior because He's worthy of our praise. I thank God for the sanctuary. Huh? I met my wife in a church. I got married in the church. If I kick out of here before the rapture, y'all going to bury me from the church. I mean, I love the church. I love everything about the church. I thank God for the church. Hmm? I'm just convinced. I'm persuaded. Uh, the church is God's government on earth. It's the place that God has ordained to do business with his people. 
I'm so persuaded, I believe anything that bypasses the church is wrong. <coughs> Excuse me, i got a real problem with uh, all these guys running around all over the country with their name and ministries title behind it. Uh, listen, there's no Doug Foster Ministries. Doug Foster has the privilege to be the pastor of the Emanuel Baptist Church, and everything I do is under the authority of the Emanuel Baptist Church. I don't need ministries attached to my name. I need Jesus going before me, Jesus in me, and Jesus behind me. Hmm? And that only happens when you do things through the church. The Bible says Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. If he loved the church that much, so, so should we. I'm just persuaded the church. I'm a church man. I'm a local church man. I believe in the church, and I thank God for the church. You ought to be persuaded about the sanctuary. You ought to be persuaded about the servant, the man of God. Hmm? He's more than just your buddy. Mm. And I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor here, but the man of God ought to be the most important voice in your life. He watches for your soul. He spends time with God, seeking God's uh, mind and God's will for the church, and, and he's seeking a message from God to help you. You ought to be thankful for the man of God. Mm. Now, I grew up in a day and age, you never called the man of God by his first name. That was a good way for mama to smack you real good. Knock your eyeballs in the back of your head. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was always by his last name. Now, when I surrendered to preach, I was pretty young, and you know, people called me Brother Foster made me feel ancient, you know? So I just told everybody to call me Brother Doug, and that's what I've always been is Brother Doug. But you need to respect the man of God. Right. You need to be thankful for the man of God. You need to support the man of God and hold up his hands. Uh, and you need to be persuaded that the man of God has been ordained of God to help you and your family. Uh, the man of God prays over your children, your grandchildren, as long as you see them serve God and do something for God. So you need to be persuaded about the servant. You need to be persuaded about the sovereign, about God himself. Uh, don't let that word sovereign scare you. You know, there's, there's a lot of hyper-Calvinists use that term sovereign. Uh, and try and talk people in the fact that God predestinated people to die and go to hell. That's not what the Scripture says. Mm -mm. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him come, and drink of the water of life freely. Uh, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, not just a few in the world, or the elect of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You need to be persuaded that God is God, that he is on his throne, that he is in control. Now listen, long before we ever was, God knew about this coronavirus. He knew who would be here today and who wouldn't be here today. God knows. He's just God. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He knew the end from the beginning. That's just God. I love when I get to thinking about how when he was on the cross dying for our sin, he was looking ahead in time and seeing us. That was the joy set before him, that you and I would believe on him. And he's hanging on the cross, he said it'd be worth it. And if you and I would get a glimpse of heaven every now and then, we would see what trials and what problems and what things we go through. It'd be worth it when we get home. It'd be good for you. But you need to be persuaded that God is in control, that he is the Lord, that he is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. That he is omniscient. That means he knows all things. That he is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere all the time. We give the devil too much credit. We think uh, the devil makes us do everything that, that we end up doing that isn't right. No, a lot of times it's our old rotten flesh. It's that sin nature that we don't beat down enough in our lives. But can I say, the devil's not sovereign. The devil's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all the time. Uh, how in the world can he be messing with you when he's messing with me? No, he's not. Ever. Matter of fact, very few people ever even get his attention. He's got a bunch of imps running around that'll mess with us, but he's not omnipresent. He's not all-powerful. Matter of fact, he's powerless before God. God threw him out of heaven. One of these days, he's going to throw him in the lake of fire. Hmm? The devil's not all-knowing. That's why you've got to be real careful when you start admitting your faults orally. Because 
When one of his imps hear that you've got a real problem with a certain area in your life, guess where they're going to tempt you all the time? You've got to be real careful. Uh, you've got to be careful if you pray out loud because he's a listening too. I found it a good way to pray is just pray scripture. The devil hates scripture. He run from that. Hmm? Just plead the blood of the lamb. He hates that too. But you need to pers be persuaded about the sovereignty of God. You need to be persuaded about the importance of supplication. God talks to us through his word. We talk to him through prayer. And prayer is where the power of God comes from. Uh, I'm convinced if we would pray more and talk less, we'd see more happen. I promise you another thing. If we get to heaven, we'll realize we didn't pray enough. You'll never pray too much. So I've, I've run out of things to pray for. Well, prayer is encompassed by several things. There's thanksgiving. You need to be grateful to God for how good he's been to you. There's praise. You need to tell God how wonderful he is. There's confession. When you realize you've come short of his glory, you need to confess that. Uh, and there's also uh, intercession. You need to pray for others. Uh, matter of fact, most time when most people pray, all they're doing is asking God for needs. Well, if you read Matthew chapter number 5, you'll find out he, or he already knows, or Matthew chapter 6, you find out he already knows your needs. He knows your needs before you do. That's why a lot of times the answer is already on the way for you even though there's a problem. If you'd spend more time asking God for other people's needs, you'd find out how many more of your needs he'd meet and how much quicker he'd meet them. It's, it's very important, but you need to be convinced or persuaded about the importance of prayer, supplication, calling on God. I mean, I wonder how much better our country would be if we'd spend more time praying for it than we do uh, complaining about it. Hmm? I wonder how much better our churches would be if we would pray more instead of complain about them. There's, there's so much you can go in this area. But uh, we just really need to pray. Touch heaven. You know, the old timers used to talk about praying through. What they were simply saying is you just stay before God until you know that God's heard you. But see, we have come to this instant mentality of the day. I mean, we run through McDonald's to get a hamburger, and then we complain because it's, you know, overcooked or undercooked or they didn't take the pickles off or something. I mean, used to you want a hamburger, you used to take about 20, 25 minutes. Now they just throw it in the microwave and throw it in, in a bag and throw it in your car. You know, we, we got microwaves, you know. Used to, if you wanted to watch a television show, you had to wait all week for it to come back on. Well, now you can stream it or whatever. You can watch it whenever you want. I mean, we just want everything instantly. And that mentality has, has boiled over. I mean, we live in a society that never sleeps and everything's going on. And I, I mean, I remember used to folks go to bed at 8, 9 o'clock at night. And I promise you, you know, after Johnny Carson, there wasn't no more TV on. It was over. You only had three channels anyway. Uh, but now people are up all the time and society's going. Everybody's got to, yeah, and it's filtered into our spiritual lives. We blow into church. We want God to bless us. Then we blow back out into this world. We don't sit still and spend time with God. The scripture still says, stand still and know that I'm God. But we don't do that. I mean, every, even our church services, people are geared, get me out by noon. There are some churches, you don't get them out by noon, they're not coming back. Sometimes we're just getting cranked up at noon. Huh? But they'll sing two songs of Just As I Am for the invitation. Nobody comes, they'll close her down. I remember one time we had a missionary come through, and he said that he was under conviction. And they ended up singing 10 verses to Just As I Am. And on that 10th verse, that's when he came and got born again. Now he's a missionary winning people to God. Amen. 
See, sometimes we get in too big a hurry. We don't let God work. Listen, if we're honest, <clears throat> we don't read the scriptures or pray as much as we watch TV or on Facebook, on Twitter, on emails, on all that other stuff. And so we got all this stuff clouding our judgment. We come to church and we're going to give God 40 minutes. And we expect God to undo all that cloud, work in our life, change our life, do something spectacular in our life, and then close the book on him and go back out and do whatever we normally do. Do you know why usually Sunday night services are better than Sunday morning? Sunday morning typically gets the bark knocked off of us. So we can come in Sunday night, we're ready to worship. But if we would worship before we get here, then we'd have better services we need to be convinced at how important supplication is how important it is you don't know how many people have contacted me this week want prayer want prayer for others know somebody's sick I mean it goes on and on and on I don't know when I've seen so many lives affected by virus, by death, by things going on. Just want prayer. I mean, I've, I've had to make it a point as soon as they call, I stop right then and pray, you know, because I might get a call at 5 o'clock and have to tear up a kitchen and stuff. I mean, you know, sometimes we'll say, okay, I'll pray in a little bit, and then a little bit never comes. There's a lot of people hurting right now. A lot of people going through things right now. I got a phone call on the way over here uh, to church this morning. Um, Chris Grubbs from Funeral Home let me know that one of the ladies in the office, she, she passed away last night. I mean, it's just uh, people are hurting, people are suffering. Uh, Miss Amy Jo reached out to me this morning. Yeah, that Sands family she's requested for, or prayer for. They've had four or five deaths, and they had another one yesterday. I mean, just in the last month, you know, all kinds of things, strokes and heart attacks and all kinds of things. And then Miss Amy said her sciatica nerves messed up today. And I mean, folks are just hurting. And so we need to understand when it's out of our control, it's not out of his control. He's the great physician. He has a balm of Gilead. He has the answers. And so I'm convinced that God will either heal you Help you through it, through it, or he'll hold you through it. But we just need to get him on the scene. Then I thought about this lastly. Just some things we need to be persuaded of. We need to be persuaded of the Savior's return. He's on his way. He is on his way. If you can't see the handwriting on the wall, friend, you don't know much about the Bible. I mean, as much as... Elected officials are trying to control people. It's all pointing toward the Antichrist. I mean, uh, Biden, if he does get the presidency, he's, he's already mandated you're going to have to wear a mask. They're already saying in, in you know some circles that when this vaccine comes out, you can't get on an airplane unless you prove that you had the vaccine. How are you going to prove it? Might have to have a mark on you. We headed that way. Now listen, I, I know Jesus is coming. He said, as in the days of Noah. And can I say, <laughs> Noah's day was a filthy, wicked day. It was so bad God repented that he even made man. You think God's happy about this society we got? Uh, America has aborted 60 something million babies you think America is going to get away with that uh, I wonder about that Ruth Ginsburg I wonder what she thought that last breath she took she went out into eternity all them babies she caused to be aborted when she the Supreme Court Justice had to stand before the judge I wonder what she thought. Hmm? Listen, 
America has broken down all barriers of what we esteem as holy or righteous from the scriptures. Nothing is right in America anymore. Now, I know, I know I'm ancient, but I remember when you walked in, you shook somebody's hand, and that was, that was a contract. Now you can sign triplicate contracts, and that don't mean anything. Some of these ball players are signing these multi-million dollar deals, and the next year they want to reno renegotiate the contract, get more money. Contracts don't mean anything. People all the time going and borrowing money, and then just not long after that, file bankruptcy so they don't have to pay it back. The Bible makes it clear: you owe nobody anything. What's that mean? That means pay your bills. Hmm? The marriage has broken down in America. And that's what they were guilty of in Noah's day, swapping off wives, giving in marriage. And can I say, used to, I do, meant for a lifetime. Don't mean that anymore. Matter of fact, used to, uh, they were committed to their vows in sickness and in health, you know, till death do us part, for better, for worse. Now, they don't even want to say them vows. They write their own. And people enter into marriages now with the idea, well, I'll try it out. If it don't work out, I'll get somebody else. That's what, that's what they enter in. If they even enter into marriage. Huh? <laughs> now, again, I'm old, but I remember they wouldn't let a man and a woman have a hotel room unless they could prove they were married. Now they let them buy houses together, shacking up. You think God's pleased with all that? He's coming. He's coming soon, friend. I remember when they brought out that song in about 1983, The Midnight Cry. Huh? That was a great song. Old City brought that out. And Ivan Parker sang that song. Man, he had a voice. I mean, he'd sing that song, bring chills, down you? That song was so powerful, it was song of the year for two years in a row. And that was in the 80s. 30 years ago. And we was looking for him then. Friend, he's coming. I'm persuaded of that. He's coming soon. Are you ready? He's coming. We need to be persuaded of some things. We're more than conquerors of some things. We need to be persuaded of things. And you need to be persuaded that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. He loves you, friend. He wants what's best for your life. He is the Lord. And He's able to change your life, change your situation. He's able to change everything if you give Him your heart. If you allow him to change, he'll change it, friend. And God never asks something from you that he doesn't replace it with something far better. Why don't you let him impact your life by you being persuaded of these truths and the wonderful book divine, the scriptures. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.